Good morning. There's a new rat pack of MPs in the House of Commons at Ottawa. I'm not talking about the old liberal rat pack. I'm talking about four MPs who are going to drag their feet, if you can believe it or not, in the passage long awaited of Bill C-49 to clear the prostitute pests off the street of Vancouver. Since 1978, people with common sense and decency have been saying, look, we know prostitution's always going to be here. All we ask is amend the criminal code so that we can take them off the streets and make them secure for decent people. We've had guarantees from almost everybody. Watch what these four MPs said last night on our 6 o'clock news. After all, it's a, a problem that's been around for quite considerable time, I'm informed, and I, uh, I think we should be through it before Christmas, but that's a, a wide guess. We have to think in terms of the rest of the country as well, and uh, uh, we have to wait in line but, so that you can't just drop everything and, and stop for that. It may get the prostitutes off the streets, but where are they to go? Uh, it doesn't deal with, with pimps. And we believe that uh, pimps have to be dealt with in a, in a very severe fashion. I'm concerned that the people of Mount Pleasant uh, are not, in fact, getting the kind of cooperation that they should be getting, and that, in fact, the city of Vancouver and the province of British Columbia are just passing the buck to the, to the federal government, hoping that they'll bring forward this kind of sledgehammer approach, which is unacceptable. That's the man, Robinson, who told me the other day that he would do nothing to hinder the passage of that bill. His leader, Broadbent, told me the same yesterday. Nunziati, the liberal you saw there, has the gall to say we must do something about pimps. Nunziata doesn't know we have a criminal code in this country, which when the evidence there deals perfectly satisfactorily with people who live off their veils of prostitution. We on the coast, and I can speak without fear of contradiction, want to see C-49 passed without any more foot dragging by MPs of any party. And Webster has the gall to say that in front not only of Broadbent, but here we have John Turner, the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition in the House of Commons, and he will, I'm sure, not weasel on the answer to the question. That and other topics was the man who has risen like Phoenix from the ashes after his shaky start to be hammering Mulroney with clubs and darts and arrows and spears each and every day as the Tory government is shaken and rocked by a series of scandals and attacks on the credibility of the Prime Minister, him Prime Minister himself. No more teases, no. John Turner after the break. <laughs> Mr. Turner, simple local issue which affects all of the nation. Will you allow any of your Tory caucus to delay or drag their feet on the passage of C-49 to amend the criminal code about hookers? Well, Jack, first of all, we're talking about a liberal caucus. And uh, we're talking about our members who want to give that bill a thorough debate, but we're not going to delay it. No, we're not going to delay it. That bill will be in the committee. And that bill will be studied thoroughly. We will cooperate with the government to get those hookers off the streets. But the bill has flaws. Uh, the, the word communication means uh, convert solicitation into a wink, into a, into a, into a nod. That, that concerns us a good deal in terms of... Uh, John, you're splitting here. I'm not splitting here. You're doing a Sven Robinson. I'm not doing a Sven Robinson at all. And I'm also saying that uh, we're going to have to look uh, as to whether we're sending... Uh, sending uh, these women underground, and whether, as Nunciata pointed out, we aren't uh, dealing properly with uh, the pimps and the, and the customer. If we're not dealing properly with the pimps, it's the fault of the police department. You as a lawyer know as well as I do that there is legislation to deal with pimps under the criminal court. I know that, but the short answer to your question is, we'll support the bill. It's not a perfect solution. We're concerned about the civil rights aspect of it. That definition of communication is far too wide. And uh, aside from that, uh, that bill will be out before Christmas. It'll be before Christmas? I would think so. You know the trouble we're having just now in Mount Pleasant. Do you know that part of this city is under a common law injunction, which I've never seen before, prohibiting a certain class of people under common law from being in a certain area? Surely we must get the law amended so that we can forget these, uh, what's the word, draconian injunctions. Well, I think, uh, I think Parliament, Parliament will come to terms with it before Christmas. It'll be out. 
That law will be passed. What you're telling me is that the liberals will take part in a full debate. There will be no rushing the bill through for the sake of the people on the West Coast. There'll be no rushing the bill through, but there'll be no filibuster. There'll be no holding it up unduly. It will be properly examined. It has some weaknesses. We understand the problem here in Vancouver and other cities, and it will be done. By Christmas. My Christmas. John Turner says, wait in Mount Pleasant in the West End until Christmas, which might be 1986. Maybe we can still have this bus when Expo opens. Uh, no, the, by the next time I'm on the program, Jack, you'll see a lot of good progress here. After all, uh, you know, the Minister of Justice still has his responsibilities. He's got to move it along, too. It's been debated since the Debbie Hutt case in 1978. We've well. had commissions, we've had inquiries, we've had women's groups, we've had everything in the world. We've had three governments since that, then. That bill was only, only uh, introduced about two or three weeks ago. The debate started only a week ago. It hasn't been long, it hasn't been prolonged, it hasn't been delayed, it hasn't been stalled. It'll be dealt with, Jack. You heard where we stand. Next question, a perfectly simple question which requires a perfectly simple short answer. Are you in favor of excluding Lyle Island from the Moores Bay Park so that we do not lose approximately 300 jobs over the next 25 years? Are you in favor of excluding Lyle Island and letting these men up there continue their jobs? Now Jack, you know that Jill and I were up there for six, six days in the Queen Charlotte's looking around South Moresby taking a personal inspection of that whole situation. So was I. I know, you got there with Jack Monroe just after we left, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to educate you up there. But so you disagree with me? I'm just saying You want to log Lyle Island? I'm just saying that South Moresby should be a national park. And I've encouraged the new Minister of the Environment in Ottawa to get together with the Minister of the Environment here in, uh, in uh, Victoria to see what they could do to make that a a national park. Now, with two, I, I make, I make two, uh, two, two observations. First of all, the Haida people have lived there for three or four thousand years. Uh, the Haida nation has lived off the sea, lived off the resources of those islands, and I think whatever rights they have must be respected. As for the logging, I think there can be selective logging done there in a way that will not harm the tremendous environment on the shores. So that's our position. Uh, I think it's a good one. I think it makes the necessary accommodation. And frankly, in terms of employment, you've got to realize that most of those loggers don't live on the Queen Charlotte Islands. They come up from the mainland. They are contract loggers. They are not uh, permanently attached to the islands. So uh, I want uh, proper compensation given to the logging industry, to the independent contractors. I think there are places on the islands where logging can continue. After all, the Queen Charlotte's represent less than one-tenth of one percent of the total, total logging available in British Columbia. But I believe that that heritage, that environment, the tremendous bird nesting, the aquaculture, the oldest forest in the world. Some of the trees that we saw there are 1,200, 1,500 years old. Nobody argues. Well, okay. Nobody argues. That's what we're trying we're to say. We're merely saying there is a small island with 20 years logging left in it, a minimum of 12 or 15, with an established camp which uh, keeps the tobo industry going, the airline industry, the logging industry, and the sawmills on the lower mainland, and it's already logged. Why in the name of God can't they continue to log that one little island well, which is not really in Moresby? You take a look and see what that's doing to scarring that forever. You know, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty desperate situation. I'm at, I'm at the Concerned Committee we of Citizens up there. 14.3% unemployment in British Columbia. We're not like Ontario with 8%. All we're asking is one little already logged island to be allowed to give Jack, jobs to people other than welfare. Jack, there are places on those islands where logging can continue. I'm just saying that in South Moresby, we've got one of the treasures of the world, and we've got to maintain it. Fair enough, but you don't mind if uh, the camp on Lyle closes on 15th of October and these guys go back wherever they can find Well, I don't have the final decision over that. I want a long-term solution. I want everybody treated fairly, including the logging industry. There's room for them up there, but the park, I believe, has to come first. The environment has to come first and the rights of the height of people. Well, people in the Charlottes, you've had your message from Skelly. You've had your message from... John Turner, that's the NDP and the Liberals. And Broadbent, too, he takes the same position, more or less, as Turner. So, the hell with your jobs. We'll get down to the national crises after the break. <music> Urgent copy on the Canadian Press Wire says, and we must, I must give you this before I ask Mr. Turner about, about it, 
Prime Minister Brian Mulroney has declined Tory National Director Jerry Lampert's resignation, despite remarks last week in which Lampert publicly contradicted Mulroney aides over when they were informed that Massey, the communications minister, was under investigation by the RCMP. A statement from Conservative headquarters said today that Lampert has apologized for his remarks and the party steering committee agrees with the decision not to accept his resignation. Now, that is one of the crises in British Columbia in which I believe Mr. Mulroney's credibility was challenged, correct? Damn right. And what happened here is that the national director of the party, that's Jerry Lampert, told Canadian press and then repeated it before millions of Canadians on the CBC that he had told senior officers of the prime minister in July of the Marcel Mass case. People in the prime minister's office disagreed. The prime minister said then he was going to conduct an investigation by getting one of his own members of parliament, Peter Elzinga, who happens to be president of the party, to have an investigation. I said to Mr. Mulroney, you don't need any investigation. Call in Lampert, call in members of your office and find out what happened. Now, obviously what happened, the pressure was on, Lampert has apologized, he swallowed his words, just as John Fraser had to swallow his words, just as that poor member of parliament, Fred McCain, down in Charlotte County, had to swallow his words, just as those eight members of parliament, whom the union leaders said met with the, uh, the workers down in St. Andrews, now all deny there was ever a meeting. I mean, what's going on here? There's a conspiracy of silence, there's a conspiracy of, of cover-up, there's, a, there's, a, there's an effort to contain the damage done to the Prime Minister's credibility. The Prime Minister said he didn't know. We have to take his word for it. It, seem, it would seem that the Prime Minister has adopted the Nelson touch on each occasion. Hear no evil, see no evil, do no evil. Well, I said in the House of Commons, Jack, it's not good enough for a Prime Minister to say he didn't know. Mind you, he should have known. Because the facts that led to Fraser's resignation, the, fact that, the facts that led to Marcel Mass's resignation, were in the possession of his office in July, senior officials of his office. He didn't, he wasn't told. He should have been told. You can't run a country by turning a blind eye or a deaf ear. That's not the way you run Canada. All right, where does the Prime Minister's credibility stand now? You've, you've come, you have challenged his credibility most bluntly. You said someone is not telling the truth. Do you think we'll ever get to your satisfaction the truth about all these contradictions on Mass, on John Fraser, on Lampert, or whatever? Well, we haven't got the full story, Jack. Uh, naturally, uh, a Prime Minister stands up in the House of Commons and says, I didn't know, then we're obliged to believe him. But the contradictions haven't come from us. They've come from the National Director of the Conservative Party, and now he's swallowed himself. They come from a former minister, John Fraser, who's a damn decent guy. He has the next riding to mine, and as you know, in Vancouver South, he's a first-rate member of Parliament. Everybody likes him. Everybody respects him. He had to eat his words, and then he was canned. Uh, a member of Parliament, Fred McCain, contradicted the Prime Minister. Now, eight members of Parliament, whom the Union said visited the plant, can't remember a damn thing what happened. Uh, pretend for a moment I have, I'm, I'm not a reporter. I'm just a guy sitting beside you saying, oh, Mr. Turner, what's all the fuss about? Nobody stole any money. It's just you querulous carping critics in the opposition trying to give our wonderful prime minister such a bad time. Now, what is the principle at stake here, which should, con if it should concern people? Because many people are saying, for God's sake, drop this nonsense and get on with governing the country. Jack, is there anything more fundamental in a free society, in a parliamentary democracy such as we have, than having confidence and believing in your government? People have got to believe what government says and and we've got to believe that what government says it will do and what it says it won't do, it won't do. You've got to believe. Public cynicism about our public officials and about our elected officials is wide enough as it is without having doubts about what our leading people in public life may do or say. You mean the credibility of the Prime Minister and his office? I think the credibility of the Prime Minister and, and his office and the government is absolutely, uh, is absolutely, I was going to use the word sacred, but he's got a monopoly on that word is absolutely fundamental to our system. Uh, a free country only works if there's trust and confidence. And that's what's being heard here, and it's being heard badly. Next question. When will this affair calm down after the proper investigation by yourselves and the NDP and go away, at least until the next campaign? Well, you know, we dealt with the with the, with the rancid tuna, with the, with the fish. Uh, but that, that was a bad mistake, uh, John Fraser made a bad mistake. 
And if John had have taken that stuff off the shelves the first day, that would have been the end of it. But what happened was the Prime Minister said, I ordered it off the shelves. And John, of course, made the mistake of contradicting the boss. He said, no, I ordered it off the shelves. And he had to revise his statement, and of course, three days later, he was out. We would have let this issue go, but we keep getting new incidents. Well, take the mass affair, though. Yeah. Now, if this is an, it's an allegation of overexpenditure under the Elections Act, right? Right. Uh, on, an, on a simple allegation, he wouldn't have had to resign, would he not? And, until the RCMP were investigating. Well, he's not the only member of Parliament being investigated. Right. And there's a presumption of innocence. Did he have to resign at all? Uh, I, uh, that's a question of judgment. Uh, I think that he did the proper thing because he's a minister. I don't think he has to resign. No member of parliament has to resign no, because uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a presumption of innocence. And Step the, aside until. The, 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 that's right. But Mass did the right thing. And uh, uh, so we've, we haven't quarreled with Mass, but we have quarreled with the prime minister and his office because the national director of the party said that they knew about this in July and nobody told the prime minister. But it was perhaps the most uh, damaging thing at all of where the official of the PMO went to the uh, New Brunswick MP McCain, wasn't it? On which McCain changed his story. Brad McCain has been a member of Parliament now for 12 or 14 years. I know him well. Uh, he's a member of Parliament where that tuna factory is. Uh, Fred talks to a Canadian press reporter. On five times he says, I brought it up in caucus. It was important to the 400 people working there. Uh, then he says, I hope I didn't contradict the Prime Minister. Uh, he calls back the reporter a half an hour later and said, I've been talking to Pat McAdam. Now, who's Pat McAdam? I'll tell you who Pat McAdam is. Pat McAdam is an old buddy of Mr. Mulrooney. He and Mulrooney were roommates at college at St. Avex down in Attaganish. McAdam says, Fred, you must be wrong. It didn't happen in caucus, did it? And Fred McCain <laughs> says, well, Pat, if you said it didn't happen in caucus, I guess it didn't happen in caucus. He then phones Canadian press. And, and retracts his story. Corrects his own story. Yeah. It's kind of comic opera, isn't it? It, uh, if it didn't go so fundamentally to the trust in government, it would be a farce. Can Mulroney survive this without any... Uh, 211 majority, 210 city members, money for old rope. Well, his, his majority is intact, of course. He's got two or three more years to run. His mandate is secure. But I believe he's been shaken by the one thing that when you lose it, it's awfully tough to get it back. Trust. Confidence. More with John Turner. Your questions soon, too, after the break. John Turner hit the headlines, as he does every day now, when he said the other day that there should be an investigation of perhaps Gulf avoiding a billion dollars in taxes, Gulf oil, on the Petrocan deal. That's right. Please explain it, because I can't understand what you quoted as saying in the papers. Well, when, when those assets of Gulf Canada were sold by Chevron and uh, bought by Canadians, they used uh, little-known sections of the Income Tax Act under the partnership rules to revalue the assets up. In other words, if the assets were worth 100 bucks. They revalued them at 2 or 3 or 4 or $500 and then took the added depreciation on them. The whole result is that the federal government, the people of Canada, have been deprived of about anywhere up to a billion dollars in taxes. Tax rulings, I understand, were granted. I've asked for those rulings so that the people of Canada can see them. The Minister of Finance says no. The Minister of National Revenue says no. He says they're privy to the, the taxpayers. I said, you can solve that problem. <coughs> Invite all the participants in the deal up to a parliamentary committee and have them produce their own tax rulings. I said to the Minister of Finance, you cost us over a billion dollars, perhaps two billion dollars in these bank fiascos. Here's another billion dollars that Canadians don't even know about. Come clean with that one too. A perfectly legal revaluation of assets being sold, the ones that were bought by Gulf Canada, event, by Petro Canada. Some of them bought by Petro Canada, some of them bought by Olympia and York, some of them bought by North End and so on. And by upping the valuation under a tax loophole, they can then depreciate that amount and avoid a billion dollars in taxes. That's what it amounts to. That's damnable. I'm saying what that... Is, no, I think dude, as a former Liberal finance minister, you must have put that loophole in. There's nothing illegal about it, but those tax rulings were given by the Department of National Revenue with the knowledge, I am sure, of the Minister of Finance. And my question to him is, why didn't you tell the Canadian taxpayer? And if you're trying to get this deficit under control, how do you square it? As the Minister of Finance, and you were one, 
you would be informed of these major tax rulings, would you? Uh, a tax ruling in that amount, I would have had to have been informed because it affects the whole public uh, financial posture of the government. A billion dollars is a lot of money. And a billion dollars puts the Minister of Finance another billion in the hole after his one or two billion on the banks and so on and so okay, on. Okay, well, a billion dollars, well, we don't, you don't know if, whether it's half a billion or a billion and a half. I don't know the facts because the government won't give us the facts. I know how the deal was put together. It's well known in Montreal and Toronto how it was done. The Canadian taxpayers have been hit for another billion and didn't know a darn thing about how it. How much have we been hit by the collapse of the two banks? How much? Has the taxpayer put in in vain attempts, bad, bad political judgment, to save these mm. banks? Well, uh, the Bank of Canada published figures to show that it supported the Canadian Commercial Bank up to the tune of one billion three hundred million. It supported the Northland Bank up to six hundred million. So you've got about two billion there. Then the depositors apparently are going to be rescued in the Canadian Commercial Bank. That's about another six hundred million. And the depositors in Northland, I don't know what the figure 400. is. 400. 400, okay. So you've got 2 billion right there. Now, there may be some offsets. We can't tell. But when the uh, Minister of Finance and uh, Mrs. McDougall, the Minister of State for Finance, came to Parliament, came to us, we supported that original bailout on one condition. We asked the Minister of Finance and we asked Mrs. McDougall, will it work? Will this do the trick? Is the bank now solid? They gave us that unquivocal answer, yes, the bank is solid. But that you, was on the CCB. That was on the CCB, but Jack, it turns out that they hadn't done their homework. Nobody, nobody looked at the books of the Canadian Commercial Bank to take a look at the loan portfolio. They flew blind. They conned Parliament. They conned the Liberal Party. They conned the NDP. They sucked in the chartered banks into the deal, and they misled a whole slew of credit unions, including a lot of credit unions here in British Columbia, municipalities, school commissions, people who then deposited with the Canadian Commercial Bank, some of them by way of debenture, and they may not be covered. So they've left a, just a string of people hanging out there. All right, you say you voted for the rescue of the CCB on the Tory government's assurance that it was a safe bet. That's right, sir. Now, should Barbara McDougall, therefore, and or the Minister of... Should Barbara McDougall have to resign because of her performance in that? We've been quite clear about that. Barbara McDougall misled the House of Commons. I'm not saying deliberately, but she misled the House of Commons because she hadn't done her homework. It's a billion dollar, it's a billion dollar goof. It's amateur night on the Rio. Uh, she ought to be out of there. She's, uh, she's lost the confidence, I believe, of the financial community. She's lost the confidence of Parliament. One other question on the banks, because I was talking to some bigwigs the other day who were trying to con me a different story. And by the way, Jack, I, uh, the Minister of Finance has got the general responsibility for banks. He ought to be out of there, too. I, I think if you're going to restore confidence in the supervision of our system and the proper regulation of our system, both ministers have to go. You want to shoot them down like nine pins. Well, you've got uh, Coates uh, gone on his own. You've got Fraser gone on his own. You've got Massey gone on his own. McDougall should be out and Wilson should go. Oh, well, they've got 200, 210 members. They've got a few people they can call on. At the time, I remember Bowie saying that they would put in a, as much money as required to keep that bank afloat. What's that effect? They put up a 250 million bail package, right? The bailout package. That's right. Did we, the taxpayer, put in that 1.3 billion dollars so other people could take the money out and flee? We don't know the answer to that. All the only way to find out, Jack, is to get the list of depositors at the date of the bailout. And the list of depositors, that's in March, March 25th, I think. And the list of, de uh, of depositors at the date of the, uh, the bankruptcy, March the 3rd. And see who stayed in, who came in, who went out. The minister will not produce that list. He says, the Minister of Finance and Mrs. McDougall says, those lists are confidential because banking is confidential. I say, fine, that's so when a bank is still solvent. When a bank goes insolvent and a curator is appointed or a liquidator is, is appointed and you go under the winding up bag, then the creditors become public property. And I say there's no way the people of Canada should bail out people to the tune of a billion dollars without knowing who they are. Who are those depositors? I'd they? love to know. So would we like to know. And uh, Because that bank offered higher interest rates and it was people who were gambling a little bit. They went for the 11 and a half when the other banks were 10% by putting it in the CCB on Northland, didn't they? They They're free enterprises. They should suffer. They, they paid a higher interest. They, they got a higher interest rate because they were taking a higher risk, and now they're being bailed out. So that the whole interest rate structure in the country doesn't make sense. What you're telling me, John, 
John Turner is it? Here we are in British Columbia. We're in a parlous financial condition. We're 14 point some percent unemployed. And we can account for $2 billion given to rescue people with money. And your friend McDonald and the McDonald Commission wants to, if he ever can, to wipe out the social progr programs and to screw down the pokey, doesn't he? Well, uh, Don McDonald has got an encyclopedia there, that report. You had him on his program. Yeah. Uh, we've broken that report down into its four specific areas, social policy, uh, into the economics and so on, to try to, try to analyze it. It's, it's got $20 million worth of research. We might as well look at it. But um, I wouldn't trust this conservative government to play around with our social programs. But just a, a, jo a jocular question, please. Yeah. Are you going to have a ceremony to drum McDonald out of the Liberal Party? <laughs> ah, Don, Don McDonald is still a liberal, as far as I know. Mind you. Uh, Funny kind of liberal. Mind you, he's had a, uh, he's had a, uh, a lightning blow to bolt strike him on the way to Damascus uh, when, he, when he talks for free, for we'll free call time. Him, we'll call him St. Paul McDonald. We'll call him St. Paul. Um, your questions. What do you think of Turner nowadays? He got off to a bad start. Is he any better? <laughs> no, no. What do you think of Mulroney? Do you accept his, but also nice Nelly about it, credibility after the break? <laughs> John Turner is leader of the Liberal Party, leader of Her Majesty's Opposition in the House of Commons and MP for Quadra. And you've got another town meeting tonight. Half past seven where? 7.30, Prince of Wales High School on Eddington Avenue, just behind our Butas Village shopping centre. Have they been good, these town meetings? We're getting up to a thousand people there, Jack. Uh, it's wide open. Anybody can come and put questions to me as their Member of Parliament. You don't really have to live in Quadra. If you can't meet your own member of parliament, come and meet me tonight. <laughs> I mean, uh, we start at 7.30, and the meeting goes on until every question has been answered. Any free coffee? We'll get some coffee there. Just one. Go ahead to John Turner. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Good morning, uh, John. Good morning. Uh, they're uh, about this here logging industry up there. Hey, Mr. Turner, you, you, uh, how would you like to, us guys to cut off your wages and take your job away and put you on welfare? I think the guys up there should go back to work they, and they should take it in their own hands. You shouldn't leave it up to you guys, because I don't think you know what you're doing in Ottawa. Well, I tell you, I spent six days up in the Queen Charlotte's looking at the situation before I said anything about it, unlike some politicians who've just flown in and out. Or some reporters. Uh, well, Jack was there three days, so I'll give you that, Jack. But um, I'd, uh, there's lots of room for logging in that part of the world. There's lots of room for logging on those islands. I just want to preserve that part of South Moresby, which is a priceless heritage of the country. I think we can have selective lobbying, logging up there and protect those jobs. I don't want to nag you on that forever, because our positions are clear. You're, you're, you're evasive on Lyle Island, and I say save Lyle Island, and for God's sake, give them the rest of Mosby. Well, I can't do, a, I okay, can't do no, anything about Lyle can't. Island. That's, that's the provincial government to decide whether that permit's going to be renewed or not. That's, True enough. Uh, Go ahead, yeah. please. Good morning. Morning. I'd like to know what the Liberal Party's position is on the possible sale of Teleglobe Canada to a private investor. Well, uh, we've taken the position on all the Crown Corporations that uh, before any sale is made to private uh, interests, we want to know what the terms of sale are in advance. We want to know what about the employment prospects for Canadians. We want to know what's going to happen to the technology. We want to know what's going to happen to the future export potential of those corporations. When it comes to Teleglobe, here's one of the best properties around. We don't want to see the best properties uh, uh, sold off and, 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 the, and the less uh, favorable properties kept. So, in principle, fine. If the government wants to sell Teleglobe, let's look at it. Let's see what's happening to the Canadian technology as a result. We want to see the terms of sale first. Go ahead, please. Mr. Turner. Yes, yep. sir. Sir, do you uh, see any set pattern to these uh, epidemic of resignations that anybody who wants to hang on to their job has to be willing to sweep some Mulroney dirt under their carpeting or face a Mulroney vendetta? And it seems to go beyond cabinet ministers and caucus right into law enforcement. Mr. Simmons, the RCMP commissioner, was ordered by Mulroney to investigate reports that the Mulroney limo had mowed down a puppy in Gatineau Park, after which Mr. Simmons came up with the story that, in fact, it wasn't the Mulroney limo at all, but an RCMP security vehicle that done the job. I remember the incident. Is his, que is his question worthy of any note? Well, I think the question is worthy of note. I think uh, we've reached a, a ridiculous stage in our public life when the commissioner of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police does an investigation of his own men and women to see whether they salute or don't salute Mila Mulroney or whether they lower their eyes when the Mulroney's come past in the car. 
I think it's absolutely a farce, but get down to your, get down to your main point. It's quite clear that uh, the Prime Minister uh, I, uh, says he didn't know. Anybody who contradicts that, and there have only been conservatives who've contradicted it, either has to resign, shut up, or swallow himself. That man's uh, ego will not take any competition. Go ahead, please. Hello. As regards the tuna fish, uh, it seems to me unfair I realize that John Fraser has made a mistake in what he did, but to me, as an innocent onlooker, it seems that the, the prime villain in the piece was Premier Hatfield, who seems to have twisted his elbow. I don't know whether that is correct or not. Have you any comment? Well, I don't disagree with that, uh, with that version. Premier Hatfield interfered politically with the Minister of Fisheries, John Fraser, uh, and persuaded him to overrule his, his health inspectors, his fishery inspectors. I think John Fraser made a mistake. If John Fraser had have taken those things off the shelves, immediately it became an issue, instead of waiting 24 hours in Parliament. And even after 24 hours, if he hadn't have contradicted the Prime Minister, he would, would still have been Minister of Fisheries. I think uh, uh, everybody in Parliament respects John Fraser. Yes, we do. Uh, he's straightforward, he's honest, he's been a first-rate member of Parliament. Uh, he's got guts, he's got courage. He made a bad decision here, but had he corrected it early, he would have still been there. His mistake was, he got canned by the Prime Minister for contradicting the Prime Minister. Go ahead, please. Good morning, uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, Good morning. There's a, there's a bill in the House uh, that's called uh, C-74. And the purpose of this bill is, uh, is to deduct uh, the unemployment insurance that old age pensioners get from time to time when they go to work. And, and to, to deduct this unemployment insurance off their old age pensions. Uh, consequently, what it actually does, it, it takes away that sacred trust that, that you people are always are talking about. Okay, hold it there. Do you understand what the I, man is saying, I, sir? I don't understand that bill. I haven't been made aware of that bill. It, it surprises me if that's what the bill says. I think the old age pension is obviously what Mr. Mulroney calls a sacred trust. He tried to play around with it uh, in May and June, and we pushed him back, and so did the older people of the country. That old age pension is part of the social contract of Canada. Anybody who gets to the age 65 gets it. There should be no deductions from it, and it should be protected against inflation for life. Do you think that uh, Mulroney eventually will go after the universality of family allowance? Well, he, uh, Jack, he said uh, during the election uh, that universality was a sacred trust uh, that was fundamental, that the universal delivery to all our citizens, rich and poor, was the way we should do it and that we should have equity in our system by way of taxes, progressively higher taxes for those of us who make more money. Uh, he has taken one step against family allowances. But, he but he's starting, well, this budget is a real sneaky one. He tried to de-index old age pensions, that is to say, take the protection against inflation away <coughs> from the old age pensioner. We forced him back on that. But really the people of Canada, the older people of Canada mobilized and forced him back on that. Now he's trying to do it to the average family, which means that the family allowance will be cut 3% per year, per year, per year. But he's done it to the whole income tax system so that we will move into higher brackets year by year, 3%, and the government of Canada will have a hidden bonanza by 1989 of $11.5 billion. In other words, the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister didn't have the guts on budget night to say, we're going to tax you. We're going to increase your taxes. They did it in a sneaky way by taking away the protection of, of inflation. I brought in that system in the budget of 1972 because I said to Canadians, look, Jack, if you get a 5% raise, but inflation in the same year is 5%, you're back where you started. But that 5% raise may put you into a higher tax bracket. And so you're taxed more on, the, on, on a higher nominal right, figure, right. but the real, same real income. I said, I will index the system so that you only get taxed more if you're really earning more over inflation. He, you're telling me he's done two things there, but he's taken away 3% of the potential increase from family allowance. Every year. And has he also taken away the indexing of the of all the Of all the tax brackets, of all the deductions, that is a massive hidden tax increase. Canadians don't yet know about it. We're going to fight that budget every inch of the way because he hasn't been man enough, the Minister of Finance, or the Prime Minister to say, we're raising your taxes by this much. He's doing it around the back door. Eleven and a half billion extra by 1989. By 1989. And those are figures from the Department of Finance, which we had leaked to us. Go ahead, please. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Turner. Yes, sir. Yes, as a politician, can you empathize with the people involved in this tuna affair that, uh, that they wanted to 
observe the jobs that were kind of on the line when when all this was happening or or do you think that because of allowing that tuna to be on the shelf they've uh, uh, cost more jobs in the long run? Well, I think two two things happened as a result of this this tuna affair. First of all, the Canadian consumer uh, uh, bought uh, rancid tuna on the shelves. That's one thing, and I believe that our health was jeopardized. I think that was a bad mistake by the minister. The long-term fallout, though, is perhaps even worse. I think the first-rate reputation of our fishing industry, not only in canned tuna, but canned salmon here on the coast, or canned uh, crab, canned lobster, has been hurt on, wor on world markets. When that stamp, product of Canada, goes on the tin, it's got a worldwide <laughs> reputation. Right. So that in order... Premier Hatfield wanted to save 400 jobs. He may have saved them in the short term, but in the long term, he's ruined the reputation of the product for many years. That's the fallout that worries me. It's going to affect, I believe, our fishing industry on both coasts. Hold on. More calls to John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party, leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, after the break. <laughs> From Seward, Vancouver Island, to John Turner. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Turner a few more questions about Lyle Island. Yep. Um, he said that the people that are working in Lyle live in other areas of B.C. They don't live in other areas of B.C. They're from other areas. Their home is Lyle Island. And it's just like somebody from B.C. moving to Calgary. All I was saying is that uh, most of the loggers there, they're from British Columbia, but they aren't, they aren't native to the Queen Charlottes, and they aren't permanently resident in the Queen Charlottes. That was the information that I was given That's when I was there. We don't need to go over that again. You merely want to express your dissatisfaction with his lack of a clear composition in Lyle Island. Is that yes, correct, ma'am? Is that correct, ma'am? Yes, that's Thank right. Thank you, ma'am. My, my position on Lyle Island is very, is very clear cut. I mean, I support that moratorium, and I'm saying we should not further destroy that priceless heritage up there. Moratorium, look carefully to see what should be properly logged. Oh, no. No, that's what you said. There are places you can log on the Queen Charlotte's that won't touch that South Moresby. There's lots of room up there. But don't go down to the shore and, and kill off uh, that tremendous environment. That's what I'm saying, Jack. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, but Mr. Webster, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Turner if he thought that his attitude uh, in general politically was constructive to the nation or uh, what is his motive for his rather... Uh, young um, attitude toward other people in, in the opposition party. You're, you're talking about the criticism of the government? I think, yeah, I think it's a pretty... Uh, well, Sir Winston, Churchill, and, uh, Sir Winston Churchill said that the duty of an opposition is to oppose. Oh, I understand, and, and when, but when, with wisdom, not with... Well, uh, um, you know, not with this hammering nonsense. Well, uh, sometimes you might, might think that the, the House of Commons is a bit of a circus. It certainly but, is. But if you go back, uh, if you go back to the pre-Confederation debates that formed this country, or go back to the debates in the 19th century between Sir John A. Macdonald and Alexander Mackenzie and the House of Commons in those days, 1870, 1880, it was wilder than anything we've ever seen. And it was rougher and the language was more brutal. But look, let me make the point. My view is that we should oppose constructively. If the government brings in a good measure, we should try to amend it if we think we can approve it, otherwise we should pass it. If we don't like the measure, or we think the government has omitted or made a mistake, then we should deal with it very aggressively, constructively, but aggressively. Also, as, as, as our mandate goes on in Parliament, the Liberal Party will be presenting alternatives to the present government in terms of positive policy. But you know, when you've got a minister who, who allows rancid tuna to get on Canadian shelves, I believe Canadians want us to go after it. If we've got uh, a bank failure, which is going to cost taxpayers a billion or two billion dollars, I think the people of Canada want to know the answers. Now, that's it, what, that's why what the people... Why isn't there a basis in Parliament for um, the, pos the possibilities of bank failure? I beg your pardon? Why is it, why is it not that there's been... Why am I, what I'm saying is, why wasn't anyone prepared for the possibility of bank failure and what one would do in the situation? Mm -hmm. I mean, bank failure has occurred in nations all over the world, and I'm certain that Canada's not the only one that had it happen to it. You know that we haven't had a bank failure in this country since the Home Bank in 1923? And uh, what happened here is that uh, the homework wasn't done, the supervision wasn't done, and, uh, and uh, the Department of Finance, the Minister of Finance, brought an inadequate package to Parliament because he hadn't done the homework. Go ahead, please. 
Hello. Um, my question is to do with the bank failure as well. Um, I'm hearing you say that Mrs. McDougall said everything was fine, in good shape. So you voted in favor of the bailout. That's right. But I think that sounds pretty weak. Um, you mean to tell me that you vote on an issue based on another person's reassurance? Like, why didn't you ask for the facts or some statements? And why didn't you investigate before you voted? Well, first, first of all, we have no power to investigate. Uh, we don't have the ministerial authority. The Minister of Finance, Mr. Wilson, and the Minister of State for Finance, Mrs. McDougall, have the authority under Parliament to regulate the banks. We asked them whether the proper homework had been done. We asked them whether the bank, with a $250 million bailout, would then be solid, would then be solvent. We've got to rely on ministers under our system. Uh, they have to do the homework. They're running the show. Now, uh, that's the only way we can do it. And that's why you say that Barbara McDougall not deliberately uh, misled the House by giving what turned out to be bad information on the survival prospects for the CCB. Barbara McDougall misled the House, the Minister of Finance misled the House, and the Prime Minister, who wanted the bailout in the first instance, without having the facts, wanted a bailout because he didn't want a bank administration, a bank failure, rather, during the Conservative administration. Western Canada institutions, Western Canada institutions must, you know, must be saved, must be saved, must be well, saved. Well, I think the best answer to that, Western Canadian institutions, surely we were interested in that too. But Nelson Reese, the NDP member for Kamloops, had the best answer to that. He said, look, this is a mistake, whether it's West, East, Central, North, or South. Go ahead, please. Hello, good morning, Jack. Good morning, John. Good morning. Uh, congratulations on your good work in Parliament. And keep it up. Thank you, sir. You've got to get rid of that uh, gentleman there. Uh, but as Moresby Island goes, they don't need to log that. I'm an ex-logger, retired. They don't have to. There's lots of other logging. Okay, thank you very much. He's on your side. I'll cut him off. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. <laughs> Webster. I'd like to ask Mr. Turner how uh, Mr. McDonald expects people to live off this annual annual allowance fee. You're talking about the McDonald recommendations for the thing called WISP, uh, yeah. a kind of guaranteed annual income. It's all hypothetical, well, isn't it's, it? It's, it's a, uh, what it works out to is, he said, if a single mother is on her own, the oldest child is classified as an adult. What it works out to is a family of four with a single mother gets $525 a month to live off of. Well, we're going to look uh, very suspiciously at any attempt by the current Conservative government to implement any of McDonald's propositions on social policy because we do not trust this government on social policy. We caught them on the de-indexation of old age pensions. We're fighting them hard on the family allowance. They've de-indexed the whole income tax system in a sneaky way. We're going to be watching them very carefully. I don't think, frankly, I don't think this government has the sense of purpose or the sense of direction to, accompli to accomplishing anything massive, whether it's free trade recommended by McDonald or whether it's the guaranteed national, uh, national income. I don't think they've got the purpose, the direction, or even the guts to do it. It's a weather, weather vane government. If you blow, they change direction. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, yes. I'd like to describe my experiences with tuna. I have eaten a lot of tuna over the last 10 years, and occasionally I have bought cans of by-the-sea tuna and other kind of tuna which I identified as coming from eastern Canada, and I have always found that tuna coming from eastern Canada to be terrible. I fail to see why so much fuss has been made about uh, a batch of uh, tuna. Why did you buy it if it was terrible? Well, I, I, I eat a lot of tuna, and I occasionally buy it, buy uh, different brands in order to try them out. In other words, you say that it was, a, it was in its normal condition on the shelf. It was in its normal condition, and it, and, and it wasn't poisonous. It wasn't contamina contaminated with botulin botulism. It's just rancid. Well, the, you know, the uh, fisheries inspectors said it was rancid, decomposing, and to use the classical words, unfit for human consumption. And is this not... Uh, a, a gathering together and a, con and a collusion of those people who are against free trade in order to discredit the Mul Mulroney government so that he will be in a, no. a less reputable position in order to negotiate make any sense. free trade with the United States. No, we understood you on the smelly tuna. We don't understand your question. More to John Turner after the break. <laughs> John Turner, your question. Right, yes, that's Good morning, you. Jack. Good Come morning, on. Mr. Turner. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask you about Canadian savings bonds right now, since you're on here, and uh, how it concerns the income tax. 
What do you mean? Well, what this is happening here now, a few of us chose not to put them on the RRSPs. And uh, to save for our retirement, we've uh, chose to put them in Canada savings bonds. Now reading the paper here that uh, the income tax is going to make you from 1982, I think it is, declare all the interest on the bonds. This might be all right for a guy that's going to continue on working. But for a guy that's taken himself off the workforce at age 60, which got just about a year to retire, it's going to put us in awful financial difficulties just to pay the income tax. Well, I guess that uh, what you're talking about there is the accumulated interest uh, that you don't receive, but uh, now has to be declared if you roll over your bonds. I, uh, without seeing the bonds that you hold, I can't give you any, any tax advice on it. Uh, all I can say is that uh, Canada savings bonds are the best investment uh, you can buy. Uh, they're based on the, the credit of the country. You've got to look at the interest rate this year, decide whether that's a good, uh, a good thing for your own portfolio, for your own savings. Can I, you put Canada savings bonds in RRSPs? Well, uh, I... Uh, sure you can. Not to no. use the RRSPs. No, no, not to use the RRSPs. But it is a fact, is it not? This, a lot of people don't realize this, that now any bonds you hold, or when you roll them over, even if you haven't drawn the interest, you must declare it. Yes, the interest is declarable on, a, on an annual basis. And as a matter of fact, uh, my own, I shouldn't be in the legal game anymore, but you ought to declare interest every year and get it out of the way. You Other, otherwise, it. you're going to have a big bill at the end. Do it, because you're going to pay it one day anyway. That is right. That's the wrong one. Wrong one. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. My question to Mr. Turner is, why is it so difficult for Mr. Dye to look into the uh, situation with Petro-Canada? I believe he has to go to court in order to get information on how much money was spent on purchasing the company. I guess what the issue is is that the the confidential documents given to cabinet ministers uh, prior to their making such a decision are considered to enjoy the confidence and the privilege of cabinet documents and are not open to public scrutiny. And that's done from administration to administration. For instance, uh, Mr. Mulroney succeeded me. He signed a letter in my favor that he wouldn't go into our records without my permission. In fact, uh, without the Clark of the Privy Council's permission, the Secretary of the Cabinet. And I had to do the same thing to Mr. Trudeau, and Mr. Trudeau to Mr. Clark, and so on. Dye wants those documents. So what he's doing in court is testing whether a court can pierce that cabinet confidentiality for the purposes of his report. I don't want to prejudge that, but it's a very fundamental issue. Do you have an opinion? Well, isn't there a lot of taxpayers' dollars involved here, Mr. Turner, in doing this? I, uh, I, my own view is that uh, so far as, and when I was prime minister, I said throw, throw open the documents. So, so far as those documents do not invade ca cabinet confidence, uh, certainly in terms of how the deal was put together, I think they should be available. And uh, I said this uh, yesterday in the House of Commons on the Gulf Canada deal. I think the tax ru rulings should be made available. So, yes, let's find out what went on in Petrofina. Suits me, suits me just fine, and let's find out what went on in Gulf. Suits me just fine. The Auditor General, Mr. Dye, has got a very technical problem here. How far does cabinet confidence go? Is it the decision of cabinet? Is it the immediate advice given to cabinet? Or does it include every document that preceded that advice? What, That's the question. What you're saying is that you approve the availability of factual material from these documents to allow the uh, Auditor General judge the worth of a deal. I think that the factual background material should be separated from the memos of advice given to cabinet. I think, I think you ought to protect that advice because public servants give the best advice they can. Cabinet ministers want the frankest discussion they can. Fine, I, 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 I agree with that. But the underlying factual... And that would include all the political nuances, too, wouldn't that it? That would include all the political nuances. That, that ought to be, that that ought ought to be, confi to be confidential. confidential. But the facts, the deal, who made what, that ought to be public. Good point. Yep. I didn't realize before that you signed a prime minister to prime minister to prime minister. Oh, yeah, and the, and the secretary to the cabinet is the custodian of those documents, and he is bound by those letters. It goes right back to Johnny McDonald. Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Turner if he knows the future of the, the LNG plant proposed for uh, the Rupert Kitimat area. Well, I, uh, I remember I had something to do with that when I was back in private law practice. That really depends on the Japanese and whether they're willing to give a long-term contract at a decent price to the to that plant and to the uh, people of British Columbia. The Japanese have been very skillful at playing us off against Indonesia and playing us off against other countries. They play us off on 
on coal. Uh, on coal, they play us off on iron ore, they play us off on natural gas. I can't give you an answer to that. It really depends on what kind of contract can we get from the Japanese. There are no such firm contracts yet, are there? Certainly will. There are no firm contracts yet, and uh, uh, even firm contracts sometimes tend to be less firm than you would, would have thought. Go ahead, please. Hey, Mr. Turner. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm calling in regards to the Gulf Oil Petro Canada situation. I just wanted to ask you about your criticism of the tax write offs uh, by Chevron, I guess it would be. Uh, as Jack pointed out, it was your government that would have, uh, or at least the Liberal government, that would have passed those loopholes in the first place. And now you're criticizing the Conservatives for, you know, allowing them. And I was just wondering. No, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not saying, and I said in Parliament clearly yesterday that the, the law is there, the deal is legitimate, but it, depe it depended on an advanced tax ruling from either the Minister of National Revenue or the Minister of Finance. My question is, there's a billion dollars, I believe, involved. Why didn't the Minister of Finance or why didn't Pat Carney, Member of Parliament for Vancouver Centre, who was the Minister of Energy, why didn't somebody tell the Canadian people that that was a billion dollar hit against the taxpayer? Nobody told us. I want to know the facts. And I asked the Minister of Finance, here you're wanting to get your deficit under control, you're wanting to get the public debt of Canada under control, you've just blown a couple of billion on the banks, why didn't you tell us about this? Why don't you give us the details so we know about it? Yes, of course, because it, it was Petro Canada's policy to buy the gas stations, was it not? Well, the Petro Canada bought the gas stations for about $870 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know how that was financed as well. But the, the, real, the real point is, Look, uh, no hidden tax deals of that magnitude without telling the Canadian people. Then we can make our own judgment. That might have been the only way that Carney and company could swing the punches of the gas stations. Well, that's right. Is that a bad, is that the right inference? That's a good inference because the deal, the deal was over. So and, then two, and then two weeks later the deal was on and obviously, I think, the tax ruling had something to do with it. Yeah, I get that point quite clearly. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Turner. Good morning. Um, a lot of us wanted you to do well in the last... Uh, election campaign and, and you were sort of stuttering and unsure of yourself and almost painful to watch sometimes. And now you seem to be really sure of yourself and, uh, and confident and, uh, and you speak well. How did this metamorphosis happen? How do this? Well, uh, Tell me, John, do they, okay, said he's know? not going to quote McLean's magazine, but the knives in your back <laughs> only hurt when you laugh? <laughs> you know, uh, you're a uh, Iona Campanola is the, is the president of the Liberal Party, and she was originally from Prince Rupert. She said even Wayne Gretzky, had he been off the ice for eight, eight years, wouldn't have been too good on the rink for the first two or three games. I guess that, that, that happened to be after eight or nine years out. It took me a little while to get my feet again. It took me a little while to be in control of the issues. In fact, uh, during last year, uh, after the Conservative government got that huge majority, the Canadian people had a honeymoon with Mr. Mulroney. They wanted that government to succeed. They had voted massively for a change. They wanted the Liberals out. And for me to get tough uh, during that first year would have been counterproductive. Now there are some legitimate issues. The Conservatives are making decisions. They are making mistakes. They're going in directions that we can't, can't, can't estimate. So it's legitimate then to come on a little stronger. I'm trying to come on constructive. I'm trying to come on in, in a positive way. But when they're giving us so many, they're getting so many mistakes, then I think Canadians want me to go after Mr. Mulroney and that government. You're doing well. Thank you. You're doing well. Mr. Turner thinks that Mr. Mulroney is manna from heaven for the Liberal Party. After the break. <laughs> go ahead to John Turner. Yes, Mr. Turner. Yes, sir. The other night, uh, the uh, American ambassador was being interviewed on television. And when he was being questioned on uh, a free trade agreement between the US and Canada, um, the number one point he brought up was the opening up of Cana the Canadian banking institutes to uh, the Americans. Um, now that kind of, you know, the, the closed shop, now that kind of scares the the hell out of me because uh, if I read it right, uh, the uh, Continental uh, or the Commercial, is it, uh, which bank was it? The, the Canadian Commercial Bank. Yeah, Canadian yeah. Commercial Bank. 
uh, one of the main reasons it uh, managed to go down the tube was because of its buying into an American institute. Um, what uh, what do you have to say about uh, that? Let me, uh, this whole free trade uh, arrangement with the United States, we don't know where the government's going. Prime Minister last Thursday got, got up in Parliament, made a speech, and you can read that speech, and you don't know which direction the government of Canada is going. We take the view that, fine, we want to explore mutual access, better access into our joint markets across that border. But we want to find out the parameters or the, the details of uh, what the Canadian government has in mind. We don't want our financial institutions sacrificed. We don't want our cultural institutions sacrificed. I don't believe agriculture ought to be a part of the deal. I don't think the auto pact ought to be a part of the deal. But we get most of our information these days from the U.S. ambassador to Ottawa, from the chief negotiator in the United States, from the U.S. trade representative in Washington. None of our people, none of our government are telling us because they don't want us to know. And that secret document that the Toronto Star got, and we have a copy of it, says don't educate Canadians, keep it low profile. Uh, do a selling job, don't encourage a public debate. They went farther than that. They said, go after some of the members in sensitive writings. Go after Turner's writing in Vancouver Quadrant. Do a survey on it to find out what the people think about free trade. And I said to Mulroney in, in Parliament, look, <laughs> I know where the people of Vancouver Quadrant stand. They want freer trade. They want better relationship with the United States. But we're also interested in the Pacific Rim and Korea and Japan and China and so on. But that kind of sneaky, secret, uh, low-profile game is not in the interest of the country. Let the government come out straight. The answer to your question is, I don't believe our financial institutions ought to be part of the deal. You're talking about the report which, was, which gave a kind of media management of the free trade issue. Isn't that right? Yeah, a, a, a very controlled management. Keep it down. Don't tell Canadians until you have to. Keep the negotiations secret. Uh, we say, no, no. But oh. doesn't every provincial premier have to agree before he can make a single proposition to the Americans? Well, our friend Donald MacDonald said this just the other day. He feels that the Canadian government would be crazy to go into negotiations with the United States before having provincial agreement. Now, there's a federal provincial conference of first ministers in November. And I suggested to Prime Minister Mulroney, okay, put this on the agenda, make it a public meeting, and let's uh, tell the provinces, if you're not going to tell Parliament, at least tell the provinces what you have in mind. What, what are the limits? What is the scope? What are the parameters of the deal you want to make for Canada? I see your boy Peterson, and Peterson, isn't it? David Peterson. He got up at the Empire Club and nearly blew my socks off when he said it would mean the loss of 850,000 jobs to Canada. Mind you, they would be replaced and so, but he used the figure. 850,000 jobs he used would that be affected by direct he open used, free trade. He used that figure, and he uh, suggested in that speech that he got that figure from Mr. Kelleher, the Minister of Trade. Now, I don't know whether whether he did or not. But obviously, any arrangement with the United States is going to have its top, uh, upside and downside. Sure, I think it's going to open more jobs for us, but it's going to cost us a lot of jobs. What I'm saying, Jack, is tell us which industries are going to be at stake. Tell us where the jobs are. Tell us what adjustments you're going to make for our working force, our, our working men and women. And frankly, I mean, to go into a fundamental arrangement like this that, will, that could change the whole nature of Canada, without coming clean with the Canadian people and with Parliament is the wrong way to go about it. Now, I hope he comes cleaner with the provinces in November than he has with Parliament Go so ahead, far. please. Oh, yes, Mr. Turner. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I voted for uh, Mr. Mulroney in the last election, and... Um, well, too many did. Uh, I think uh, the main reason a lot of people did was because they had lost uh, trust in, the, in uh, your party. Uh, what was happening with Mr. Uh, Trudeau, you know, he seemed to got very arrogant and didn't want to, you know, uh, confront the people with what was going on. Uh, they took Mr. Mulroney uh, at his word, you know, the trust, uh, his integrity, his promises. I think the thing that really hurt uh, your party uh, was this thing with the patronage. And yet when he got into power, he seemed to do the same or worse. Uh, you know, his promises on forestry, what he was going to do down here, but when he got into power, it just wasn't there in the budget. Now, the thing I can't understand is with everybody asking him about his, uh, you know, his integrity and, uh, you know, about what's going on at being at odds with his ministers about this tuna thing, and it was just put to him so easily that why not put it to a committee and let it come out? And I, I think, you know, it would hurt your party. He'd have nothing to lose if the truth was there. Why not come clean with the Canadian people and, and have it go to a committee and say, see, you people are wrong. And I was telling the truth. But what has he got to lose? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the NDP has suggested that uh, the issue go to a parliamentary committee. We wouldn't oppose that. 
Uh, the contradictions uh, af affecting Mr. Mulroney are not contradictions we've imposed. They're contradictions from his own national director of his party, from a member of parliament, now from eight more members of parliament, uh, from a former minister, and so on. I, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, what Mr. Mulroney is left with here as a result of the last two or three weeks is a, a hemorrhaging in terms of trust and in terms of, of confidence. Uh, and uh, that's going to be very hard for him to regain. But he doesn't seem like a Diefenbaker who destroyed his cabinet the second time around, does he? Well, uh, Mr. Diefenbaker's cabinet uh, only fell apart uh, six years after he'd been in yeah. power, and it fell apart on a very fundamental issue, on defense policy. It was a matter of principle, and there were legitimate disagreements, Jack, George Hees and Doug Harkness and so on. Uh, this cabinet's falling apart because of uh, lack of competence. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to discuss briefly immigration, and, and uh, my understanding of the McDonald Commission was saying something that we need to increase our immigration. But to me, that seems to be contrary to the position that we are in right now with jobs. How can you have more people flooding into the country when we are not in a position to adequately take care of the Canadian citizens here? Well, our, uh, our country has always prospered in the medium and long term from our immigration policy. We brought in skills, we brought in, in uh, uh, new blood, we brought in new cultures, and I think it's made Canada a great country. I think we should continue to have a constructive, positive immigration policy that allows us to take advantage of worldwide skills, worldwide talents, and worldwide energy. Now, obviously, the immigration policy is, is synchronized uh, with, with, with unemployment. But we, in the long term, uh, I believe, need a, a larger population for our markets. We've now got, uh, if we don't have immigration, we're told that the Canadian population will begin to decline. I think there's room for more people. I think uh, they brought a great cultural heritage to Canada from the quarters of the globe. And I, uh, I believe it's in the interest of this country to have a positive, constructive immigration policy. Would you make a comment on his, uh, and I might have heard this wrong, but something about compulsory military uh, for the young people, is this something that he said or did I imagine hearing that? Well, I didn't hear him say it, uh, and uh, I would find it very difficult uh, myself to contemplate compulsory military oh, service was, in this country. No, there was a vague reference by yeah, I, somebody about work. But oh, was, oh, Don McDonald, he may have been talking about some sort of national service, but I, I don't think he meant uh, compulsory military service. I, I, get, I, I find that difficult. One final section with John Turner before he heads back into the maelstrom of the House of Commons. Maelstrom, that's a good word. That's a good word, Jack. M-A-E-L-S-T-R-O-M, after the break. <laughs> Go ahead from Kamloops to John Turner. Yes, good morning, Mr. Turner. Good morning, sir. You're doing a bang-up job. Thank you, sir. What I'd like to know is uh, the, about this farce they call a question period in the house. The, uh, <laughs> the fact that uh, people, especially Mr. Mulrooney and Mr. Wilson, they don't seem to do anything except uh, they don't answer questions, you know. A uh, legitimate question, always come back with a smart comment or something. What I'd like to know is, uh, do you have any ideas what we could do to improve this question period and make the government accountable and make them answer a few questions rather than well, just, uh, you know, they seem to come back with smart comments more than they do any answering. You know, that question period under our parliamentary rules, which is now publicly televised and is over radio as well, makes us the freest country in the world. There's no other country, even Britain, where we can get on a daily basis at the Prime Minister and the ministers of the country without questions having to be screened, without them having to be approved, without them having to be rehearsed. It's absolutely spontaneous and it can be deadly. Now the rules of the House say that the minister does not have to answer the question. If he doesn't answer the question, of course, he's, uh, he's, open, to, he's open to review as to why not. Uh, the press will want to know, members of Parliament will want to know, we'll keep digging. But the rules say that uh, you cannot challenge the answer of a minister. You can go back after him, you can keep harping on it, and eventually, frankly, you'll break him down. Uh, we just put one day's worth of questions to John Fraser on the tuna thing, and he had to back down. Uh, I venture to say that our system is so powerful, I believe we've got the freest country in the world here, that the President of the United States, President Nixon, he wouldn't have been able to hold on on Watergate 
the way he did for six to 12 months, we would have got through to him in two weeks under our system. Another little point to that. The British House of Commons has written questions submitted, has starred questions. They don't have anything like the freedom, and they don't have the question. Well, they, that's right. Their question period, uh, they can only question a certain number of ministers a day, as I understand it, right. and the first question has to be in writing. Right. So that the minister or the prime minister gets a chance to look at it and gets a chance to prepare his, his or her answer. The, the uh, member, however, is allowed one or two supplementary questions that can be oral relating to the first written question. Our questions don't have to be written. They can come right out of the blue, and they affect the issues of the day. Now, if the Prime Minister's in the House, does he have to respond, or can Eric Nielsen get up and stumble through an answer? Well, the Prime Minister, if he turns to Eric and lets Eric ha handle it, or turns to a minister, that can be done. Um, this Prime Minister in the early days, Mr. Mulroney, was acting like a virtual president. He was handling everything. When the goings get tough, uh, more of his ministers are handling the questions, and Eric Nielsen's rescuing him quite often this week. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster and Mr. Turner. Good morning. I'm one of many Canadians that I know that has become totally disillusioned with politics. And since the last election, we've had the banks and the tuna, there's been the Crosby appointments. And I'm just wondering, with all the complaints and everything from the opposition, when is something positive and constructive going to happen in this country? Well, if the government can get back on its own agenda, tell us what it's going to do, for instance, about free trade, tell us what it's going to do about social policy and so on, we will respond positively. You know, uh, I don't want you to get discouraged about the political process. I said to the, the person who preceded you that we have the freest country in the world. We're only as good as the men and women we elect. And we need the best men and women to stand for public office in Victoria, in Ottawa, in your own municipality. Uh, the worst side of what's happened in the last two or three weeks is the credibility of the government, the, the loss of trust, the loss of confidence, and that adds to the type of cynicism that you seem to reflect. But have faith. It's a great system. Believe me, it is a great system. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Turner, uh, your alma mater is really taking it on the chin here from our provincial government. I sort of want to know what you federally could do as an opposition leader or what you think the Conservatives are doing. I'm going out to the University of British Columbia tomorrow. I'm going to meet the students. And unfortunately, the, uh, the new president's not going to be there. I'm out there frequently, and I'm, I'm proud to represent a great university in Parliament. From a federal point of view, when those post-secondary education agreements are renegotiated in 1987, I think we ought to have some closer conditions attached to those provincial grants. The province of British Columbia is diverting those federal monies from the Canadian taxpayer into purposes other than education. Every third question I'm asked in this province, whether it is in the interior or the north of the province, the Kootenays, the Okanagan, or in the lower mainland, every third question is about education. I think that we have to strengthen our financing in this province of education. We've got to continue to, to give our teachers the best education, the best formation, and the best pay we can. Firing school boards is the most draconian, anti-democratic step I've ever seen in my life. We need, we need to get a relevant curricula. We've got to educate the people of British Columbia, the young people of British Columbia, to meet the challenges of tomorrow. I think it's the number one issue in British Columbia, and if I were a parent here, I'd be mad. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, can I ask Mr. Turner if um, he knows anything about this home ownership charge that's still on our hydro bills? No. No, I... Uh, the excise tax has been taken off, but I phoned about two weeks ago and they tell me the home ownership is still on. Let me try to find out for you, if, uh, and I'll get back to Jack Webster and he'll give you an answer if you watch his program in a couple of days. That's take, fine, then. Take okay. Number. We'll get an answer to that. Sure. you get the answer. Go ahead, please. Uh, John Turner. Yes, sir. Quick question about one of the biggest things happening uh, in the future that we can see is the privatization of uh, Petrocan and our high-profile minister, Pat Carney, suddenly being very, very quiet. I think that uh, the acquisition of Gulf by Petrocan is uh, one of the primary rungs in the ladder towards privatization of that industry. What have you got to say about that? I'll be quick. Thank you. I'll be listening. Fine. When, uh, when the uh, former Liberal government uh, incorporated Petrocan. Its purpose was to explore and to develop in the frontier and the offshore where private capital alone was not sufficient. It was also to move towards the Canadianization of our industry. The government of the day never contemplated Petro-Canada going downstream into the retailing and, uh, and refining uh, aspects of it. Uh, nor, I thought, did the current Conservative government intend that. 
We now have Petro Canada, uh, the largest uh, retailer in the country, as I understand it. Uh, well, I, my view is that uh, the best use of the public oil company should be to continue the exploration and the development and towards self-sufficiency. Do you think they're going to privatize um, Private it? Going to sell shares in Petrocat? I don't. Like Brick, God help us. I don't know whether they're going to privatize it. I have no idea uh, if they're going to. Uh, I believe that Petrocan ought to be financed, by the way, on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, that the proper equity debt structure project by project is the best way to finance the company. Uh, I have no way of looking at the profitability of those retail stations they bought. We'll be looking at that very closely. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Come on, where are you? Hello? That's you. Yes. We hear you. Morning. <laughs> I have a question for Mr. Turner with reference to the Tuna Gate. I've got bad news for you. You haven't got a question for Mr. Turner with regards to the Tuna Gate because I've run out of time. But thanks for calling. Sorry, Thank you for calling. John, much obliged. Exactly. We'll, it's been fun. We'll see you question period. All right. <laughs> <laughs> After the Tonight at the 7.30 at Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales. After the break. Dr. Michael Gottlieb from Los Angeles, the man who discovered the AIDS virus, will be in the studio with me, that's Webster, Monday at 9 a.m. precisely. The doctor who discovered the AIDS virus, Michael Gottlieb, tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. Nowadays, you just can't get away from the discussion of AIDS. Tomorrow, the Los Angeles doctor who discovered the virus. On Webster at 9 a.m. precisely.